Now, one thing to notice about the bomb is it has these three feet on it. So, um, it'll set right down here in the middle of this container. Now, I'm going to check the temperature of the water here. The temperature is about 24 and a half degrees. Yeah? So, that's fine to conduct the experiment. Got the bomb loaded in here. Now I'm gonna now I'm gonna charge it with water from here. So you notice there's water just constantly flowing into this and out the top, right? There's a little spout at the top. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it clockwise. Oops, it's pretty sticky. To 90. And then I'm gonna turn it another 90 degrees clockwise. And now it's just gonna dump everything it has in that zone. And that works uh, to a precise volumetric level because of the way that, um, that little point sticks out and out. So it, when the water turns off, it pretty much just comes to a reproducible sort of meniscus on the end there. Gives you a good, char a good charge of water that you can realize reproduce. Now as it's filling, I can look at the bomb and note whether there's any bubbles streaming out. If there's bubbles streaming out, that means so. So is that five liters? Two. It should be a pretty much oh, it's two two nearly liters. two liters, right? And I'll just let the last couple drops come out. And then I'll turn this again, just continue to turn clockwise because that keeps that tight. I'll just turn it up here and it's going to fill, right? And now it's, now we're good. So the next step is we're going to put this back into the calorimeter. Now here's something I can't show you, but the bottom of this bucket has three little dimples. And there's three posts in here that correspond to the little dimples. Yeah, you can go in. And so what you said in I don't think it's the end of the world if it's not matched. But it's nice. So, Alright, so I'm going to see if I can do that. Yep. Cool. No bubbles. Now I've got to put the, put the wires into the holes here. I might get my fingers just a little bit wet. Probably not the best form, but a few microliters is probably not a detectable quantity. So I think we're doing good here. Now the wires, this is an important piece is to get the wires out of the way of starting. These, I'm just going to pull them forward. Oops, I said I was going to pull them forward. There they are. And I'll swing this over, right? Get it about centered. I'll lower this. Lower this guy. It doesn't really click on the bottom side, but it's fine. Now I'm going to turn the power on. Turn the thermometer on. And um, pretty much get this one. I really should let it warm up for a little while. For purposes of the demonstration, we're just going to go right ahead. Alright, so, um, basically there's some things not to mess with. <laughs> um, most of this we, we're not going to mess with. Um, but there's some operational principles I'd like to illustrate. Okay? This, is a, this is an adiabatic bomb. There's another related one called an isothermal. The way the adiabatic bombs work is they try to make the heat flow from the system to the surrounding zero. So the system is now chemicals plus compressed oxygen plus bomb plus water plus that bucket. Right? There's our system. The surrounding is everything else. And the way that the system tries to reduce the heat flow from systems to surrounding is it has an active temperature control circuit 
that measures the temperature in the bomb and in and in the jacket to the bomb, right? Has two has a pair of thermocouples, and it has a feedback circuit that warms and cools the jacket in order to match the jacket temperature to the bomb temperature. Okay. And that that circuit, uh, you know, for example, as I turn it on, it's probably cooling down the jacket a little bit to match the bomb temperature as we speak. And uh, you can look at the jacket temperature here on this temp on this thermometer, and it's right now 25.64 and rising. And this is 25.67. Now, assuming both of these are perfectly accurate, this should stop for 25.67, right? So this guy should come up around here, and then we'll be ready to roll at a real under real 80 batting conditions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. And then after you fire the bomb, the temperature is going to come up slowly, and the instrument will try to track that as closely as possible to minimize the heat loss. And since the delta T at any point is going to be fairly small, then that's, that's a good approximation. But you can identify there that any likely systematic error in the total entropy you'll get will have to do with that heat leak due to the fact that the control electronics can't exactly track it. So there'll be the enthalpy you measure may be slightly lower than the true one, depending on the perfect homology between the calibration and the actual setting. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It was a mouthful, even for me. Okay, so 25.67, boy, this is nice and stable. 25.672. This is now 25.5. Going down. And uh, I'm gonna say that's good enough to start, just for fun. And then, with any luck, when I push the ignite button here, um, we'll, we'll start to get some temperature rise here after a couple of, couple of minutes. Yeah, I know. It's pretty <laughs> anticlimactic, huh? So, yeah, there it goes. Now it's coming up. Seven. Seven. You see now you can hear that clicking. It's trying to track it. You know. And. Um, of course, what I didn't do was write down the temperature, and you, in the protocol for the experiment, you you establish the temperature baseline with several points in time, before and then after the firing. So you, you try to t keep a continuous temperature time plot in your notebook, and then at time zero you fire, and then you measure the, the delta T after that. And so, yeah, it's climbing right up. So we had a successful firing. So. Um, when you go through and do this experiment, um, there's really an easy way and a difficult way to get through the data analysis. The difficult way to get through the data analysis is to um, go through a full differential error propagation based on assumed uncertainties in things like the water volume and the um, masses of everything and the temperatures, and et cetera. And that's perfectly valid, but I think it's actually inferior to an approach where, which we can make, which is simply to make replicate runs. Now you see, um, the idea of doing the differential error propagation is when you have various sources of error that um, aggregate into a single result, and you have to account for those errors and, um, you know, a couple things may be happening. One, it's expensive or inconvenient to reproduce all the measurements or there are unknown components to the errors that you're trying to account for. But in this case, since we can calibrate, we can reproduce the calibration, we can get a standard error in the enthalpy or at least the delta T value for the benzoic acid caliber. A real honest error estimate is made by reproducing that. And then a real honest error of the two analytes, the phenanthrin and the anthracin, can be had by reproducing the value. So just to kind of save you some grief, there's, you know, we're, we'll use error uncertainty propagation, error propagation at the bottom of this lab in, in settings where it's a must. We have no other choice. But in this particular experiment, there's two ways. You can work hard on the data or you can work hard on the experiment. Or you can do both. 
but if you work on hard on the experiment, I think you get a, um, in my opinion, you'll get a little bit better estimate of the final uncertainty, which is an important you know, value. Anyway. So, um, I would say that we're pretty well stable here. And um, the, um, you can obviously look for convergence on the temperature scale here. Um, and you can see there's a little arrow up on the thermometer, which is its estimate of the tr temperature trend. But um, you'll have to um, you'll have to make a subjective judgment as to when you stop measuring, you know. And uh, a temperature time plot will help you to arrive at that. But um, I would say that at some point when you get around, you know, when you stop changing in the in the tenth of degree area, then you're you know, or if you see any fluctuation up and down, then you're good to stop. And so we can see that the jacket temperature has tracked very nicely. It's almost exactly, it's actually uh, 28.05, and this is 28.3. So it's only lagging by 0.15 degrees. So pretty good, 0.25 degrees. All right, you guys, so any questions at this point?